South African lion tracker and storyteller Boyd Vardy is back on the podcast, fresh off a 30-day isolation in his treehouse in the bush. This was a really beautiful conversation about the interactions of humans and nature. I can't wait to share it with y'all. This episode is brought to you by Zen Solar, zensolar.com, by Blue Blocks, blueblocks.com slash amp, and by Onnit onnit.com slash Aubrey. So for any of you who heard the last podcast based on Boyd Vardy's book, A Lion Tracker's Guide to Life, you'll see that Boyd not only does these things that are in a foreign world in a different way than we understand, like actually tracking lions on foot, tracking jaguars, learning how to read nature, but he has the storyteller's mind and the beautiful ability to be able to take those lessons, take everything that he observes and apply them to human nature so that we can all learn the lessons of a lion tracker, learn the lessons of someone who, like he just recently did, spends 30 days out there interacting with the natural world. And that's the value of this, to immerse ourselves in a foreign world and come back with the secondhand knowledge of the lessons and reflections of who we are when we're confronted with the mirror of the wild. But first, a quick word from our sponsors. Up first is Zen Solar. And I want to talk to you guys a little bit about solar energy. So one fact, in a single hour, the amount of power from the sun that strikes the earth is more than the entire world consumes in a year. So there is power available beaming down to earth at all times. Solar is the way to capture that energy. And Zen Solar, 100% online solar company that can help you switch to solar power without the big onerous upfront costs. In fact, they'll even show you that the upfront costs can be literally nothing. Zen Solar basically just helps you create a swap. So instead of paying all of that money to your utility company, you start paying that over time for solar. And some other facts, electricity rates in America increased by 3% a year on average and have doubled in the last 15 years. The average home with solar will save $37,000 in savings over a 25 year period. There's a bunch of other benefits. The federal government offers a 26% tax credit for installing solar. Zillow research shows that home values go up 4.1% and that solar improves the value of a home by an average of $15,000. There's a bunch of benefits and with zero upfront costs, this is really a no brainer. So if you own a home, check this out. Go to zensolar.com and just explore what solar can do for you and your family and your home. So once again, go to zensolar.com. Next, we have Blue Blocks. So one of the biohacks that is absolutely not debatable is keeping blue light out of your eyes when it starts to get dark. And the blue light comes from all the artificial light in our homes. Now, I write about this in my book, and pretty much every individual who writes about sleep writes about this. Because the problem is that the blue light then actually triggers those daylight sensors in our circadian rhythm, which actually suppresses the production of melatonin, which is the hormone that helps us fall asleep. So eliminating or at least restricting the blue lights that you're letting wash over your eyes at night is going to have a huge impact. So that's where blue blocks comes in. Now, most of these blue light blocking glasses, they look, I don't know, like not that sexy, like not that sweet. Blue blocks really took it to the best place possible and made these glasses look really good, feel really good, high quality, and just as effective as anything you will find anywhere else. So I highly recommend this product. It's phenomenal. Go to blueblocks.com slash amp. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X dot com slash amp. Or use the discount code amp for 15% off at checkout. Once again, blueblocks.com forward slash amp for 15% off. And last up, we have Onnit, and we have a new product launch to announce. Now, many of you may not know that the very first product that Onnit created was New Mood. Before Alpha Brain, there was New Mood, and that was based on my own desire to create something that could support my mood, help me relax, help me decompress after, well, I was always someone who was kind of a hard charger. And New Mood was the formula that I researched and created with the help of all of the experts that I could gather to put all of the herbs and nutrients and vitamins into a single formula to help you just take a load off. But now, just like we did with Alpha Brain, there's New Mood Instant. So it's a delicious drink mix that you can mix 
right before you go to bed or any time during the day. This isn't something that's going to make you fall asleep while you're sitting at work or something like that, but it's something that's really going to take the edge off and support your mood and just support you feeling relaxed. And actually, as one of my friends, Dr. Dan Engel says, when he takes new mood, he wakes up singing. It just changes the way that you orient yourself to life. And now with the instant formula, it's really easy to transport. You can put it in your pocket. You can travel with it. And for those of you who don't like swallowing pills, it's a benefit there. And it just hits quicker. New mood and any capsule takes about 15, 20 minutes to dissolve in the system. Instant is instant. You're going to actually start absorbing it right away as soon as you drink it. Plus, you get that extra water. So check it out. New Mood Instant is now available, and it's delicious, and it's awesome. Go to onnit.com slash Aubrey, and you'll save 10% on New Mood Instant and everything else. Once again, onnit.com slash Aubrey. And now, an uninterrupted podcast with Boyd Vardy. Boyd, my man, we are back. One year to the day almost. Yeah, only yeah. because you came out to Austin to track the mythical Yeti. <laughs> the, the mythical 100-year storm creature. <laughs> the, the snow leopards and the Yeti. It wouldn't surprise me the way it's looking out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, As I said to you, I've already, um, with South African overconfidence, uh, pranged a car into a ditch. That, <laughs> it took me 72 hours from landing in Austin. So. We drove so slow over, over here on the way. And there was certain parts of the road where it looked like like church parking, like everybody was there, but everything was backwards. So it was like <laughs> some were sideways, some were yeah. some were upside down, some were up on the hill. It's crazy, man. Yeah, it's uh, like for love or money, you couldn't raise a tow truck. And you know, as we were saying, like it's kind of reliant on it getting warm again. Otherwise, right. things would start to get really interesting. Like right. if it was going to be cold for two weeks, I think a lot of people would be. If we can get through a bit of this, but I can imagine it would get really interesting over time. I would just come over and we'd start tracking animals. And we'd like, just, get out, just, get, just get out there and live off the, live <laughs> off the, sit, you know? live off the land in the suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would, it would devolve into that quickly. So, man, what I want to talk to you about is just dive right in. You spent 30 days. 40 days. 40 days. Yeah. That is a, that's an even better number. 40 days in the, in the wild. So tell us like why you wanted to do this and what you were what you were actually doing there. You know, Orb, there were a few moments. Um, I've always had these things. I remember once at Burning Man, I was standing on the top of a, an RV and like the whole scene is going on. And I was looking out into the dark part of the desert and I heard a voice inside of me say, you should be out there. And there have been other moments all through my life where I was in a real social situation where something, you know, wild was calling and I've spent a lot of time in nature, but I have had this, um, I've had this feeling my whole life that I can't fully know myself without really deeply symbolic encounters with being in the wild. And then, you know, you start reading and there are over 40,000 accounts uh, in your, the various spiritual texts and the mystics of the mystics going into nature. Mm-hmm. And so I started to become fascinated. Jesus Why is himself, it? Jesus 40 himself. 40 days in the desert. And that's where the number came from. Yeah. I became fascinated by the question of why at a certain point in every transformational awakening is there this pull to go and be alone in nature? And so I wanted to answer that question and then, you know, who's got 40 days to go and do that sort of thing in life? And then COVID, safari business shut down, my retreats canceled, and that voice was like, it's now, mm. you got to go. Um, and so that, that prompted it, and I thought it's going to be like this journalistic account. Like I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to watch how my consciousness changes, and I'm going to report back and kind of write about it, account for it in a very like, rational way. Um, but what happened was something totally different. And one of the first things was like... Well, and, before, let, yeah. before you do that, give us your setup of where you actually are. So tell us like how you set up your spot. Yeah. So um, it's on the land that I grew up in South Africa, and I decided that um, I wanted to live in this tree, this big, beautiful, dark bowed ebony tree on the sides of a river. And what there is, is there's a wooden platform up there. And so you can walk up this little um, rickety wooden ladder, and then you're up in the tree. And then the Navi people have their hammocks <laughs> and, and the home tree, and, and you yeah. made a bow out uh, of the wood of the tree, totally. and you form Sahelu uh, with a flying <laughs> with a flying pterodactyl. 
I mean, and but there's something like magical about living up in a tree. You're living in yeah. a living being. And also out there, um, you know, the minute you get a little bit of elevation, you don't have to work so hard with um, keeping watch, that sort of thing. So the tree was up on the banks um, of this beautiful river. And then I had, I took a couple of trunks with me, which were like dry goods, um, a lot of cornmeal por porridge, which is what people eat in South Africa. And, and like one grits. Of, yeah, like grits. Like, and one of the things that I realized is like, you quickly know you're going out of a comfort zone where you find yourself asking new questions. Like, how long can I keep a cabbage in hot African heat? <laughs> like, what'll happen uh, if a monkey gets onto my mosquito net? You know, you're just like starting to explore the edges right. of, of like anything normal. Um, so, you know, I really felt myself starting to shift. And, and then, as I said, like, it, and you'll know this from, from, your various you know journeys into like retreat spaces but it's the, what's fascinating about it is it's like your psyche knows mm. it knows that something's significant is about to happen and you might have an idea that i'm going to report on how my consciousness changes but it will then start to bring things up with you yeah um that happened i mean so i had an, a week-long ayahuasca retreat at the end of three weeks in costa rica and the first two weeks, you know, everybody's like, oh, how was Costa Rica? I was like, well, it was beautiful. But I had so much stuff coming up because my psyche knew yeah. that I was about to sit with ayahuasca for a week. Yeah. But I was just dealing, I was in ceremony, you know, dealing with my own shit yeah. without any medicine for the first two weeks. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And I started asking, you know, various spiritual teachers. I have this Zen guy who I talked to and I said, you know, like, I'm going to go be alone for six weeks living in a tree in the wild. Like, how should I be approaching this? And he had said, you know, the art form of retreat is to slip the bounds of normal consciousness and allow something to take you. And I didn't really know what he meant. And then I got back to South Africa and I spoke to my mentor, who's this incredible tracker uh, who we've spoken about before, Renia Simplongo. And he said to me, the way to do it is when you get out there, be an animal, just be an animal. And I realized that one of the big limitations that I was carrying into this thing is the idea that I should know how to do this right to get the most out of it. Mm. And the real breakthrough was to let go of thinking I knew how to do it and let something more natural, like wake up when you wake up, sleep when you sleep, eat when you eat, be curious and just follow that and see where that starts to take you. And, this, and that was, that was the, the kind of the key that I needed to like really set the experience up. Like, don't know how to do it, have no idea how to do it, and start to follow something else. That's such like, I can feel the freedom wash over my own body when you talk about that, because we so rarely give ourselves that. We have all of these shoulds. I should do this, or I have to do this, or I'd look at my calendar, I'd pop open my Google calendar, and it's like, all right, this thing at this time, this thing at this time, okay, yeah. I got this thing at 1030, and that's important, so I got to get up by you know this time so I can get this workout in and get this food in, and so I can get this thing, and everything is like based upon these certain yeah. events that are fixed according to time, but the animal doesn't have that. It just does what it feels it needs to do in any given moment. Totally, just in a, a kind of intuitive arising, and you know, like, as I said, your psyche starts to know. The, the first book I opened while I was there, because I allowed myself to take books, um, the first book I opened was The Account of a Young Pygmy Boy from the late 1800s. Then it was written by this kind of rogue scientist who was a morphine addict, but that's a whole different story. But mm. basically this young boy was taken from his family. He was blindfolded, and he was taken by circuitous route by a train and vehicle, a route of about 300 miles, and ended up at a spot that was only about 60 miles from where he, he was taken, but distorted by a mountain range. And sometime during the night, he broke out and he walked on a direct line. Uh, when they tracked him the next day, he walked on a direct line back to his home. And when they found him there, they asked him, uh, how did you know how to get home? And he said, he just kept repeating, I did not know where my home was. I wanted to go home. And there was that, and mm. the scientist then described it as the capacity for purposeful action towards an unknown purpose. And as I'm sitting there in the tree reading that, I could feel that I was now becoming involved 
in the intuitive act of healing, be like an animal, follow something. There was something that wanted to be healed through the experience of being out there that I didn't know what the end point of that was yet, but something in me knew the next thing to do, the next thing to do, the next thing to do. Um, and I've been fascinated by the, like the, there is a healing impulse in all of us, but we can't follow it while we're in the roles that we're in. And just being mm -hmm. out there, it started to, it started to take me. Uh, and during those first few days, boom, um, one of my core woundings, which is, you know, being taken off the land and put in a really wildly, wildly is the wrong word, like a cemented institutional boarding school mm. where there was, you know, I started to feel now that current of something that needed to be healed out right. of that. Right. Um, so it was, it was wild. And, and I think of the first few days out there as a kind of shedding, you know, and there's, there's dimensions to it. Like one, you now start sleeping at the frequency of the wilderness. So your circadian rhythm starts to change. You start to be affected by the light. You start to eat when you're hungry. Um, and only when you're hungry, you start to be surrounded by aliveness. Um, the, your nervous system starts to get affected. There's the presence of wild animals. So all of this stuff is starting to work on you. Meantime, your psyche is starting to like bloomp, bubble up the things that are unhealed. And then there's this other, like it's almost a funny piece, like wake up at four in the morning, you know, sit, meditation, journal, make some coffee, make a fire, make some coffee. Uh, and you would go down from the tree. Yeah, I'd go down from the tree. And I allowed myself to go out into the reserve, like go tracking, come back from tracking, do yoga, um, breathe, read a bit more. 10.15. It's 10.15 <laughs> and you've got 39 days to go. Just yeah. yourself. You know, so like, you, it's not going to be like, and that initially that's anxiety, you know, it's anxiety producing, like, right. okay, where does this, where does this go? And, and like that mind of like, where does this go? It, get, it disappears after a few days. But in those first few days, I was like, okay, so just me, 39 days, 38 days. Um, and it was, I could see myself shifting out of that consciousness, but it took about four days. And there's some anxiety in that too. Like I'm out of life, you know, am I not attending to the things that I should be attending to? You know, I'm out here living in this tree. And it took four days for that to, to kind of give way. And then I felt myself starting to shift. I've been following Andrew Huberman's work, and he talks a lot about how <clears throat> there's ways in which the nervous system are ramped up for a certain speed. Mm -hmm. And there's a speed that yeah. we all live our life according to, and we're ready for that speed. And so when things slow down, we get agitated and we get anxious because our nervous system is ready for a certain pace, but the world is slow. So we're like, I'm bored, I'm anxious, I'm... And out in nature, I mean, oh. when I went to Africa, that was the thing I noticed more than anything, more yeah. than all the animals, and which were great, and, and the people, which were great. A lot of things were great. But the thing that was the biggest difference was like, whoa, it's really slow out here. Like so much slower oh than my, my life back home. Yeah. And if you watch the animals, and I, you know, I kept watching the animals around the camp, you know, buffalo around the camp, a herd of Inyala, um, it's like the perfect output of energy for the moment. Right. You know, slow movement, feeding in this like totally parasympathetic state. And when they need the intensity, they have access to it, but they're never like, they're never feeding thinking like, got to get as much food in as possible today. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. there's a total rhythm to it. And I felt that, I felt a huge nervous system change immediately. And then like energy, you know, when your nervous system starts to drop like that, it's almost like your chi starts to just build naturally. Yeah. Um, I mean, another funny thing about those early day, early, early part of being out there is, um, you know, just not looking at yourself. No mirror, no reflective glass, no, no thought every morning of like, how do I look? I've got a podcast this morning. I've got to meet I smell? some people. What, how do, like, how do I, like, I was thinking like, what is helpful to ego dissolution? on some level is to just stop looking at the identified physical self. Like a, yeah. a space literally opens up when that is not like up every day. And so you sort of, you stop, um, you stop being a version of your, you stop thinking about yourself and you just start being yourself. So there's a lot of like little subtle things like that, that immediately start to work on you.
When I, the only corollary I really have was my week I spent in the darkness retreat. I know. I kept thinking about that. Yeah. And that that's, was very similar in some ways. There's no nature element, but there's absolutely the absence of clock. There's the absolute absence of reflection of self in yeah. anything. And you really can't do anything. You can't even read or listen to music yeah. or write. Or I had a tape recorder that I could turn on that was blacked out. So I would talk to myself. Uh, and record it and hoping that i would get it because i didn't really know if i was pushing the button right or not or if i left it on and i you know screwed up the battery or whatever like but i i practiced a lot so i had that but there was not much else to do i could i had a little um tupperware of nuts and that yeah. was like my comfort thing like when i was just like nothing but empty space yeah. and silence and darkness so i was like you can go eat some nuts right now. <laughs> so I'd like, I would reach for these little comfortable things. Did you find yourself like reaching for some aspect of comfort? Oh, in that way? I mean, you little things like I had a bag of oranges <laughs> you know, and it's like fresh after yeah. eating cornmeal, you know, that like two o'clock in the afternoon orange. I mean, chop wood, carry water. It was like, I would select it out the bag <laughs> You know, I would smell it, take some time with my knife to like peel it, throw the peel in the river. Yeah. I mean, I, I, eating an orange, and but it's quite a lot to be said for doing one thing at a time. Totally. I mean, one of my insights was I could change my life, the quality of my life radically by just doing one thing at a time. Because, you know, it, it, how simple. So simple and, and so profound. And I felt it hitting me, like just do one thing at a time. If I could offer one thing to the community, it was like, just try that for a while and see how things change. The quality of your relationships will change. The quality of your life will change. Um, and I guess, you know, that's the art of mindfulness. But just start with that. Just do the thing you're doing. You know, do it for the rest of the day if you're listening to this live and see what happens. Um, I used to make a, a shower. Do, I mean, we say do it for the rest of the day. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Just try to do it at a couple times today. Try to just, like I have a spin drift in my hand. I have it one time while I'm drinking the spin drift. I love spin drift. I haven't one time just drank the spin drift. I've been drinking and talking, drinking yeah. and thinking, drinking and doing it. It's like the Japanese art of the Zen tea ceremony, where it's like the point of the tea ceremony is not about the tea. It's about being there with the tea yeah. completely with how you heat it, how you pour it, how uh. you whisk it, how you serve it. And that's the only thing that you're doing. And that's why they call it a ceremony. Yeah. And to do that right is just the absolute surrender to the singular event that you're doing. Yeah. I mean, the singularity of it. I mean, one other thing that comes to mind too, which goes sort of in this theme is um, like on the third or fourth day, I put my shirt on and there was a catap hairy caterpillar in my shirt and it just set my entire upper body on fire, like welts, burning welts. And I was like, you know, you start to scratch shit and caterpillar caterpillar and then the more you scratch it the more it starts to spread I think like first aid first aid get in the first aid because there's like an intensity to the the itch is like a yeah, bird yeah, yeah. first aid okay didn't bring the antihistamine cream antibiotic cream i don't need antibiotic cream okay this is bad close off close off run to the river jump in the river scrub myself with sand no this is making it worse this is making it, <laughs> run back there you know antibiotic cream fuck it that's all we got might as well be whipping cream you know and like and then like and then get into this like frenzied state of like being on fire <laughs> and like you. almost like burning, <laughs> almost hurting. And then realizing like this whole thing that I'm going through, it passes super quickly because there's no one else around to like hold the story of it with me. So, you know, it could be into like, I'm such an idiot, you know, and then like spend the whole day being like, but there's no one around. Or you go like you bang your fingers, like closing one of the dry trunks. It's yeah. Like, ah, you know, this is bullshit. <laughs> and then like, I mean, sulking is like really for the benefit of other people. Sulking, uh -huh. like mooding. Uh -huh. In solitude, you just don't do it. There's yeah. none of that like, you know, if I sit over here and brood, she's going to know that something's going on with me and maybe she'll come over and say, what the hell is wrong with you? Right. Or, and I'll show her without actually telling her that something's wrong. I mean, we just do these, like there's none of that in solitude, which is really quite amazing. Dr. Ross Ellenhorn on the podcast, he talked about, he used the word dramaturgy. Like we're in this dramaturgy where we're playing out this role, like, yeah. we're, a, like we're in theater and we do that around other people. Now we can do that with ourself as well. Yeah. And you can get caught in your own dramaturgy which is you playing a role for your own identity and your own internal self-judge that wants to look at you a certain way and think about that. But 
often we do it you know with that kind of relationship with the audience which is the other people we are our own audience but also it heightens dramatically when we have other people around us yeah i mean i watched myself you know i just watched those like so that i would say the first phase of it was like these little dynamics of physiological some transformational out of a more identified state into more stillness um, and then the next phase became, and I, and you could, f- I could feel myself shifting into it. Maybe ten days in, I started to move into a kind of a tuning, and I started to feel the wilderness more. It's almost like my own, you know, the psychological shit that wasn't necessarily valuable but was there started to move to the side, and there was a sense of now starting to be more tapped into this environment, and. One of the things that happened there, which was interesting to me, there was a personalization to my knowledge of the animals around the tree. So if you had just gone out in your safari track, mm-hmm. it would have been like wildebeest, inyala, um, you know, there's a bird up in that tree. But living there every day, 24 hours a day, it's, it was this herd of inyala that moved down the side of the riverbank that go and drink at that crossing point. Um, these black-headed orioles that fly down the southern bank of the river and feed in the tree above me looking for grubs and then at a later point in the day fly up the other side and there was this sense of starting to be in tune with this very intelligent pattern of movement um, and aliveness around you and I, I really started to feel that you know where your attention goes your life goes you start putting your attention on an alive at- intelligence that is operating around you um, it starts to pull you into more aliveness. It just Mm. starts to pull you into a sense of what was moving around me. Um, And then at the same time, memories really started to boil up, boom. You know, sitting around the fire one night, here's a, I see my 10 year old self. And one of the ways that the older boys uh, would discipline the younger boys in the boarding house is they would make a passageway um, they would stand in the passageway, and then you had to run down the passageway, and you just get smacked around as it's you like running the gauntlet, it's running, like the, the, running the gauntlet, American gladiators, totally. And when you're like, they you were got like Malibu so, with his fucking thing. Dude, you got it's people just like, and I think about it now. Like Ryan thinking, knows what I'm talking about. He remembers Malibu. <laughs> I think about it now as like you know, knowing like the families that I know now. I mean, it was like you know, run down here, and guys just would slap you on the head, and. When you're like a 10 year old, a 13 year old is a monster, you know? Of course. So then, like, boom, there's that little memory. There's, um, you know, so just things from the past start coming up and you start to see, like, okay, where did, how did that, how's that pattern me? You know, and, and then, like, okay, here comes, you wanna, you wanna cry after you get slapped around when you're 10 years old by a bunch of 13 year olds and the whole place turns and laughs at you because uh, you're crying. And there's your first encounter with like real shame. Yeah. The feeling that the way you feel is not okay to feel that way. Um, and so, you know, and I'm looking at it and then I'm looking like, okay, where's that, where's that in my own life now? Well, I control, you know, every feeling um, and I, I manage myself. And how does that manifest into my relationships now? So on the one level, you know, I'm, I'm feeling myself start to be connected to this wild place. And on another level, I'm watching the psyche, you know, do its thing. Mm. Um, so it was, you know, it was, it was really, it was deep like that. And then to not, not go into a story about it, but just to trust, like, just keep letting this process go. Keep letting this process go. Keep seeing what you get with it. Um, do, you, do you feel like the, the, just kind of the quiet and the stillness and the, the gentleness in some ways of the way that nature handles your psyche allowed you to repattern some of those traumatic memories is that kind of why you were getting you just slowing down and then being like almost like nature itself through you was saying it's okay like let's go back in here and let's show you that it's all okay i mean that is so well said because you know the opposite of that shame of being laughed at by other traumatized kids who were in the school that was not not a warm place it was like such a cold environment is to be surrounded by an alive sentience that does not judge you at all that um and you start to feel it not as inanimate at all you know alive soft 
present, um, intelligent. And I felt, I felt it was incredibly healing to a shame that had come from outside of me mm. to feel myself totally accepted and to know that for thousands of years, we lived out there um, in that state of no social judgment. You know, we lived in small groups in an environment where there was very, there was nothing judging. There was no, there was nothing idealized. And I felt my psyche healing through being surrounded by that, through encountering that. Um, and then also like just encounters with the magic of, of it, like an, a magic that would, would awe you. You know, the, the one day I, there was downstream from the treehouse there was a place where there was a V cut into the bank and it was a crossing point for animals. They would come down there, they would cross into the river and then head to the other side. And it was maybe 9.30 in the morning. I walked down the bank and I walked into the river and I t had taken my clothes off and I lay down in the water, just beautiful, clear water, you know, knee deep. And I heard the sound just like whispering. <sighs> And I immediately stood up and it was coming from up above the bank. And what it was, it was a matriarch elephant leading her herd and they were coming down a game path and the branches were touching the side of the elephants. And it was making the sound like just this like branches on elephant skin of, mm. of whispering. And so I knew they're coming to the crossing point. So I, I quickly scampered up to the top. And as I got to the top, I encountered this, this you know, matriarch who was leading the herd. And she stopped and she cocked her head. And for a moment, I just stood and, and let her get a sense of me. And I started talking to her. But, you know, the feeling of, of elephants, elephants have like such a feeling. It feels like someone, yeah. you know, banged a gong and the air is now vibrating. And you feel your adrenaline go up, but you also just feel like there's the, the field of energy just amplified. Right. And it's mid-morning and it's totally silent. And she's moving in slow motion as she assesses me. And I say to her, mama, I'm just going back to my camp. And I slip off to the side and she watches me. And I go up into the tree and the whole herd goes down and starts drinking in the river below. And there's something about an encounter like that that just changes you, you know. It changes you. It, um, it makes you believe in the world. You feel a certain kind of um, innocence in everything. Uh, and it's deeply healing to just be in a presence, to be in a presence of another sentient being like that. Yeah. You know, interestingly, I had a, I had a really deep ketamine uh, journey ceremony. Mm. And in the place that I, in the place that I went to, ketamine is a really strong dissociative. I don't know if you've had any experience with like an intramuscular, like I have, a big journey. I have one. Yeah. It was yeah. terrifying. It, it's, it's intense. <laughs> yeah. And this place, it brought me to one of the most intense places I've ever been with that medicine. And in this place, there was nothing about me that remained. I was actually pretty convinced that, whoopsies, like yeah. I went too far and I'm dead now. Yeah. But my mind stopped being able to form words and different things. And all I was was essence. And that essence could only be described as like a tone. Yeah. Like a, like if this was a note coming out of a didgeridoo or something, it was it was like a I was a note and I was an essence and I had nothing left. I had no identity. There was no Aubrey. There was no body. There was no like aspect of self that mm -hmm. remained. And it was just like I was this note. And it was interesting because I wasn't prepared for that. You know, I was prepared. I wanted to at least think. I wanted to have some shred of that. But when I finished, I was like, oh wow, that was like really beautiful to experience myself in the purest inarticulate mm -hmm. form of what i am yeah like what my energy is if i went in and said nothing you know it, it, let's say we were in the darkness or something like that and you were just in the presence of me this was the note that i was playing in that subtle energetics and elephants they have a note and all the wild creatures they yeah. have a note that they're playing in this symphony of god yeah and it and you know ubuntu the idea of ubuntu is the idea that People are people through other people. But I think that definition has to be expanded because in the presence of an elephant, you also touch something in yourself that is ancient and slower moving. And, um, you know, here's a creature that has walked thousands of kilometers across wild terrain. And that energy translates. And, and when you touch it, you touch 
you touch something of what you are um, and who you are that you that is can only be experienced relationally. Um, the the uh, you know I've also experienced God. You know, God's a tough word, and I understand there's been a lot of connotations and religious things. I always give that disclaimer when I use the word. If you prefer source or if you prefer mm-hmm. universe, that that thing is it's it was shown to me as the all sound or yeah. the all light the audible like, life stream it's like the all sound so yeah. we have that divine spark within us deep deep in our center of centers that spark of the all sound so we have the sound of an yeah. elephant we have the sound of a whale we have the sound of a, of a tiger as we access our divine spark which is all things the all sound we have that and we have our own unique note as a differentiated yeah. being so we are you know we are who we are because of everything and that's why there's not a single thing and so many different you know ways to look at this from the hawaiian ho'oponopono or the you know zulu ubuntu or yeah. um whatever it is it's it's this idea like you think you're separate you want to look out there and say that's not me wrong tatua masi another you know different part of the world that came to the same mm-hmm. truth i am that too I am that too. What what is it? Is it darkness? Okay, I am that too. Oh, is it amazing, brilliant, you know, Christ energy light? Okay, I am that too. Whatever it is, like we can find that in ourselves and whatever we find in an animal, that's in us too. Yeah, I mean, you know the Native Americans have I think that's beautifully said. The Native Americans have this idea of sit spot. And I can the idea is, is that you go to the same place every day. And you build a relationship with that place. You know, you go sit in a place in your garden. You get to know that particular robin that comes there, how that tree is at different times of the day, the feeling of that tree. And on some levels, this was like a giant sit spot. Mm-hmm. And I thought I was getting to know the wilderness at a deeper level. You know, I was, I was giving myself the chance to know this wild place so I could know myself. But what started to happen is instead of knowing it every time every day that i was there i started to feel more known by it and mm. and there was and inside of that every, you know inside of that the feeling of belonging started to take place i started to find my note in it and find my beat within it and it it became unmissable that somehow my presence there was more about more about being known than knowing and mm. feeling the way those stars affected me and the way those animals around the camp and the way that that, that you know, one chin spot battus would roost every night above my bed and the, and the feeling that the two of us were somehow roosting up in that tree. And that kind of connectivity was, it became very hard to, to ignore, you know, and I, I started to feel like I came here to, ask the question why did the mystics go to nature and what's becoming clear to me is that what this thing is is a series of infinite interlocking intelligences of which i am a part of not in a conceptual way but in a way that is so impossible to ignore that it's overrunning my my sense of self small self right um to like those various tunes in the cosmos those tones and I think that's why the mystics went because it is, it's just, beca- it became impossible not to be with something else. It's um, a, you know, you <laughs> ask that question, how did the stars affect me? But then you get in that deep mystical place in that, uh, like the undescribable metaphysical understanding. And then you realize, and how am I affecting the stars? <sighs> and you start asking these questions like, wow, like this is, you know, I am not a drop in the ocean. I am the ocean in a drop. Like, I am connected. I am affecting those stars as I look at those stars. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Maybe I'm not pushing these giant suns that are blasting from billions of light years away in a in a material Newtonian sense. Like I'm not beaming some laser beam out there. And t- but from that spiritual sense where everything is connected, I am affecting the stars as the stars are affecting me. And then that starts to blow your mind because then you think about what we're doing with the collective. We think, oh, what am I going to do in the world? The world's going through all this. You don't need to do anything but be. And by, by being yeah. something different, you're affecting the whole world. Yeah, and the feeling that it was alive and it was intelligent. I was, now we were in a relationship in some way. Um, you know, like uh, the one day 
things are going great. I'm in a deep place. I feel the belonging. I feel that alive, soft, natural essence healing some of the places where I've held shame. Um, and I go, I go to dig myself a hole to do my toilet. And while I'm bent over. You I, saved me that question by going uh, oh, here, yeah, by yeah. the way. Okay. Yeah, I just dig myself a nice <laughs> hole there. Nothing, there's no leveler, you know, like a good shit in the woods, you know. That just brings everyone down to the same level. doesn't matter who you are. And I, I'm crouched over there and a grasshopper jumps up and hits me in the eye. And there's this weird thing out there where you can also feel like the thing's just starting to turn on you. And suddenly, like, I've got this, I'm blinded in the one eye, so I'm trying to tourniquet. I can't see the the weather, the, the temperature just starts to build. It just goes to, like, the devil's barbecue, just like heat, <laughs> just goosh, through the roof. Storm starts to build. And that night, I got hit by a thunderstorm that was just absolutely outrageous. At a time of year when storm should have been passed, but that feeling of like, am I affecting it? Is it affecting me? Is this storm, did I somehow, is it happening somehow because of I need a particular type of initiation? Right. And I sat in that tree um, in a tarpaulin and this monster rolled over me. Just absolute monster. You know, when the blades of lightning are coming down around you and you can smell, you can smell the electricity like a certain type of scent in the air of like ions charging and you hear it go, you just hear tick as it touches down. Um, no, I don't know that. It, when you are so close to it, yeah. it's a little click as it touches down next to you. It goes tick, and then it goes boom. So, and the lightning goes first, and then the the boom comes afterwards. Wow! And it was coming down all around me, and I was absolutely terrified. <laughs> like absolutely, and it, I like while it's happening. You know, like I'm kind of getting into this place where it's like, this has to end because I can't handle this fear. <laughs> like, I'm so afraid it has to end because I can't hold this. And it's not going to. Tick, boom! <laughs> and it's like sonic. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, it's rare as an adult um, to experience true blinding fear. Yeah. You think of like all the neuroses we live with, like all the neuroses so different from white hot fear <laughs> yep. you know and i and i and i felt like not only was it initiating me into how small i was um but as i integrated like I, the next day i was like shaking and you just wet and that treehouse looks like robinson crusoe got shipwrecked <laughs> and shit's blowing everywhere and frogs start crawling calling in the tree above you and like your your all the hair is up on your arm um and the next day i was like okay uh, I am, this thing has showed me, like, it just showed me how humble, yeah. it humbled me. And I got through it. So it gave me both my smallness and it gave me a kind of strength. Like, I can get through that level of fear. And it, and it just like, w the wilderness itself just handed, handed me um, two sides of myself. Like a feeling of like, a feeling of nothingness and a feeling of like confidence. Okay, we've been we've been somewhere now. And you know, when you go through those sorts of things, I just felt like those type of initiations, it's you become the sort of person who that's what authenticity is to me. It's like when people meet you, they can feel that storm on you. Yeah. And they can feel this is someone who knows what it's like to be truly afraid. And it's no hiding from it. It's developing authenticity is having those experiences and going through them working with them, being humbled by them. And uh, yeah, I just feel it lives in you in some ways after that. You know? It's so, it's so valuable. And then you can, you can absolutely feel it. You can feel it and everybody has done it. And sometimes, you know, this comes from, I mean, I think it's why I, I get along with MMA fighters really well yeah. because, you know, not necessarily the amateur fighter that just goes in and a little smoker and then you know, goes to fight and is trying to show that they're tough. Like, it's cool. You know, I, I was going to do that same thing too. I was training for a fight and different things happen and ended up getting into an actual fight, but totally different story. That's a different thing. But people at that high level where your reputation, your health, yeah. you're like, everybody's watching you and you're walking alone into that cage, like facing that level of fear whether you win or lose, whatever, yeah. like that, the person who's able to do that, they have a sense about them of like, 
I've seen some shit and I've gone through some, even the weight cut to get there sometimes, like all of these difficult, challenging things. And that's only just one aspect of it. It could be any different thing. You tracking lions and being in a tree in the middle of a snow, in a lightning storm, like all of these different aspects. For me, it's been all of the different challenging psychedelic journeys yeah. and going through that week in the darkness and, you know, the long sweat lodges that feel like they're never going to end. And you're just praying that you're going to make it through yeah. to the end. Like all of these things we need them like we need these things to become who we're potentially capable of being we have to put ourselves in those disadvantageous challenging situations for the initiation purposeful action towards an unknown purpose don't know fully where it's taking in the future but you know that by having those encounters something in you is starting to change and it's you know it's not um it's not just the experience with your, like your hardness, your ability to get through it, but it's actually how it opens you into more, more dimensions of self. You know, um, the more time I spend in nature, the less bravado I have and the, mo and the softer it makes me, you know, in some like physically resilient, capable of handling situations, but also softer to receive it, to feel it, to feel more. Mm -hmm. Um, I always think the movement of the All that armor tracker. is brittle. Yeah, it's all it's, of that, yeah. that. Like you said, bravado is the perfect word. It's so brittle. Yeah. You know, when you're trying to be tough, it's hiding a deep insecurity that you're not. Yeah. And when you really are, you're so easy going, so soft. It's like those MMA fighters, they're never trying to show anyone they're tough. No. You know? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's there. On one of the, um, you know, the whole way through, there was this theme of, of purposeful action, homing towards an unknown purpose. Like, what is that? What is that that knows? Um, and towards the end, I had this experience where um, I was out, I was in the mushrooms, and a lot, late evening, and a long way away, like I was on a ridge line, I was looking out over the wilderness, some distance away, a lion roared, um, a single male lion. Oh, oh. Then I immediately got a bearing on it, and I started to head towards where the estimation. When you've got a little bit of altitude, you have a sense of it, right? But the minute you get down into a thicket, um, something different, it's, it's hard to keep any kind of vector. Mm -hmm. And so I was, feeling, I was feeling a different sensitivity in myself and just kind of following my feet, letting my feet just take me on almost on a different sense and popped out into this clearing in the late evening. And I expected like, this is where the lion would be no lion. Okay, well, you know, it's a difficult thing to do. And I'm standing there in the late evening light and out of the long grass, this male lion stands up like 40, 50 meters away. Mm -hmm. He stands up and looks at me. And there was just a, f a feeling that a sensitivity was being established. I mean, firstly, it was like, <laughs> I did it. <laughs> yeah, and just like the way he stood up out of the grass, this like gold mane. Um, but more than that, the feeling that a different kind of sensitivity yeah. was taking root. I'm really interested in living like that all the time. And maybe that was the second like dimension of the mystic is something in you knows. Something in you knows, knows what to do that is deeper than rational knowing in the same way that at a certain time of day, a leopard walks up and just starts moving in a certain direction, in a certain something in you knows. And it's, I'm interested in different ways of knowing, and I would love to, you know, find out what your, uh, that your, the guy you were referencing, the neuroscientist says about the different, I'm interested in different intelligences, I guess, and, and feeling how they come into our lives and where we operate from. I think, you know, the interesting thing is, I think letting scientists like Andrew Huberman, who I was mentioning, have these felt experiences first to like feel it. Cause that's where the gnosis comes from. That's where, you know, something is happening. And then from there, then they can apply their tools of scientific inquiry to figure it out because there is a bridge between science and mysticism. It just maybe hasn't been established yet, but I have no doubt that there's a way that, you know, that can be studied or analyzed. But first you have to get really, you have to get the best of the best, these scientists to feel it. And the experience that you're describing, you know, for me, I haven't gone on these long nature walkabouts, but we started working with Tim Corcoran with our fit for service community and we go out on what he calls soul wanders. Oh, I was just hearing about this, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and so in the soul wander, you do exactly that. 
you just let your feet and let your instinct and let your knowing take you on a journey without any thought about where you're going what you're going to accomplish you just go Mm -hmm. and you observe and you listen and you try to find and it's amazing what people have found i mean we did it out in sedona we did it in tahoe everybody had some radical encounter with something some for some people it was a tree some people it was a shrub some you know one person in particular will he got between a mother bear and her cubs and was like literally in that place and he was telling this story i remember i feel like such a dick he was telling the stories like i was in between this mother bear and these cubs and you know she was like making all the aggressive sounds and i didn't know what to do i was like bro you're exaggerating and then he's like and so i took a video <laughs> and he shows me and over here to his right is a mother bear and over here to his left are the cubs and i was like oh man you just revealed that i'm an asshole <laughs> and you were exactly telling the truth about what happened but in so many of these instances you know people finding these you know pictographs on the on the thing and a spear point in this one spot and all of these like radical things where they were just guided through this series of incomprehensible yeah you know little signs well this thing was here and it was i saw it pointing this way so i decided that that was a meaningful sign and i went there even though there was a bunch of other signs that i ignored and everybody wound up in something really interesting and, and you don't even need to be in the wild i've done that in cities before i'm just like okay i'm just gonna go and I'll find a cool shop or I'll find a cool yeah. park with a statue that I'm like, wow, that statue is fucking incredible. It's amazing what's possible when you just let those unseen, you know, our unseen connection to all things be the operating force. Yeah. And you know, even like with ceremony work, any idea you have about how it should go starts to take you out right. of how it wants to go and how it, um, but it's, I mean, working with people now, we, I mean, we really the idea of helping people cultivate the way of the tracker. It's exactly that. If you open to the symbolic dimension and ask nature to teach you, it's, it's, it's consciousness instantly starts to affect you and starts to symbolically place things in your way. Um, alive energies, presences that will affect something deeply in you if you, if you know how to do that. And it's, it's just more interesting to live relationally like that to live in those encounters and to open up the space for imagination, you know, to, it just starts to happen when you're out there a more mm. enchanted. I, I think of so much of the mission of those who are in the village consciousness, trying to wake up in a different way is to re-enchant ourselves. You know, the re-enchantment of the world to go out and say, nature, teach me, show me today, you know, show me, show me your magical way and show me something for me inside of that. And as that starts to happen, the relationship with nature, nature starts to change. And we, we get out of the mechanistic, technological, uh, space-occupying frames of um, content-driven life, convenience-driven life, into something that asks for much more wholeness and starts to pull us into it. You know? just, yeah. just the capacity to imagine with nature and see what it gives us, that's a magical life on some levels and i think i think people find the resistance to that because as we were talking about earlier our nervous system is ramped up and it's ready for things coming at 60 miles an hour and so anything that's not coming at 60 miles an hour is boring so you have to like if you're out doing something well you'll reach to your phone and you'll be scrolling instagram while you're out in nature you'll be doing something because you have to keep that pace up for your nervous system to find a chord and to find resonance with the vibrational frequency it's like you're playing some 150 beat crackhead techno you know in your song and then someone's playing some slow jazz and you're like eh, no that doesn't work for me you know so you you but it takes a little while like you have to give it time to drop in and that's why people who have like they like to go camping they always like to go camping and then some people never go camping right it's very rare that like you just like occasionally oh yeah i've been camping once or twice maybe but like most people once you get into it you realize okay you got to go for a week yeah you got to spend five days drop in and then the magic happens where everything is beautiful reverence cannot happen at high speed (laughs) right you know it cannot happen at at high speed and there's also this strange thing you know i think about like i used to have this nightly shower which was not a shower but i would i would get the fire going i would go down to the river fill up this big cast iron kettle with river water. It has this beautiful, like metallic smelling water. 
put it on the fire, the smoke would like run over the kettle and you'd get like the smoky uh, scent to the water and then go up into the tree, stand in this little bowl I had and pour this warm kettle over my head. That's the best shower I've ever had in my life. <laughs> and you're like tangibly connected to it. There's also some, there's like one of the ways meaning flows into life is when we are in very physical, tangible ways in tune with our life. And when you start to get more and more disconnected from that, you spent the day in some binary realm via a screen, like a lot of things happened, but nothing actually happened. Um, and that is a, that's another point where we, we, you just, it's like something is missing, but you don't know what, because you did your job, you did your work, everything went, you know, everything was fine. You got to work, you got back, but on some level, nothing happened. It all happened yeah. in some realm out there. Right. And, and we need a more, a live life around us to, to feel meaning in it. You know? Yeah. I was that, that came through super, super strongly. I being bet. Like physically engaged with life. One of the practices that can help with that is like a, the cold plunge. Absolutely. At the point that your body gets in the frozen cold, like at that point, you're you're alive and you're wild again you know because there's no there's no there's no, there's missing no, there's no <laughs> yeah. option for anything else like that cold hits your skin and you're immersed and your heart rate starts to change and your breathing starts yeah. to change and you start to hyperoxygenate and you you have to get yourself in accord with this strong environmental force yeah. that is affecting you and you have no choice and i think that's one of the beautiful things about it is like all of a sudden you're back in harmony with your wild side because you had to be, yeah. you had no other option. It just, it switches on a very physical encounter with life, yeah. which, which has to happen. We need more of it. We need more of that. Otherwise something's missing and you don't, you don't know what there's a, there's a longing. And you know, I've thought for a while now that some of the depression and anxiety that we're seeing it's just undiagnosed homesickness for that feeling of being tangibly connected with the alive presence of nature around you, the feeling of belonging, the feeling of being a part of those interlocking intelligences. And it, and we, it drops you into this place. You just think there's something so fundamentally wrong with you, but it's not. You just need to tune yourself back in to that other place. Homesickness is such a like beautiful word for all of these maladies that we face because you look at it, and you look at, you know, I think the the work by Holt Lundstadt and then, you know, Vivek Murthy, the former Surgeon General, and they talk about loneliness and they all of these different big, big studies and analyses of all these different studies, they found that loneliness is the number one predictor of early mortality, mm -hmm. you know, all cause mortality. So people who are lonely are more likely to die of any cause and also have all of the depressive you know, different psychological conditions that also exacerbate that. But loneliness is not determined by how many people are around you. It's determined by an innate perception. It's your own idea of whether you are lonely or not. And so you can be completely by yourself, but not lonely. When you're connected to the wild like that, like you're not lonely, even though you're not around anybody. After the first three or four days, when the mind gave up, that like natural kind of resistance when you're getting out of normal life. Um, once that passed, there was not a moment of loneliness. No, you know, no sense of, of being unmet in some ways. Um, in some, in moments there was like, there are things about this I would like to share, but it didn't come with the feeling that I've walked with in my life of being somehow different, you know, somehow that, that feeling of being somehow outside of things. Um, that people who long to live differently sometimes carry with them. Yeah. It was just, it was like a bomb of, of the fullness of connection flowing into you. And um, yeah, towards the end of it, I felt um, like the fundamental abandonment of being pulled as a 10 year old off the land, locked in a dormitory, beaten to a pulp. Um, I felt it giving way to like what that what that trauma had given me and the feeling that I was taken from the wild but but that was also what gave me the longing to always go back to something wild in myself and to be there with it it, it was just offered on levels that I couldn't possibly have imagined yeah yeah and so it healed it was a healing in and of itself you know my yeah. and my journalistic review was was gone 
and I was, you know, being given something every day out there. I had a question on a, I did an IG live yesterday and I had a question for someone who's like, I, I just can't seem to find, you know, my friends. I can't seem to find my tribe. I can't seem to find people to connect with and I feel really lonely. And, you know, my suggestion was that, you know, one, all right, there's ways and strategies to go meet these different individuals and go find your friends. I mean, it is a big impetus for why I created the Fit for Service Academy, mm-hmm. the online app, places where people can meet of these similar mindsets and and find resonance and accord with people. But that's not fully necessary to not feel lonely. Like you can find that connection to nature itself, mm-hmm. to the divine, to the mother earth, to, you know, your own self, which contains all of that again, you know, the ocean in a drop. Like you can find that connection so that you don't feel lonely even when you're completely by yourself and that's i think a great place to come from because it requires nothing and then when you're in that space you'll find that you're naturally attracting you know so many other people who want to find that it's like you found your way home and so everybody else looking for their way home they're going to be like hey you found your way home yeah you're like yeah yeah, i did like i can show you and then all of a sudden you have many brothers and sisters of the way who are joining, you know, joining on the same journey to go home. I, I don't think that, um, I don't think you find your community and get connection. I think that you, you start to find connection and then your community comes. Mm. You know what I mean? It's, it's everything in the mystic is backwards, right? Yeah. It's like St. Francis of Assisi um, walks into the town square takes off the robes of his rich merchant family and says, I renounce everything. I'm going to be alone out there. I'm going to go and find a connection just by myself out there. Um, Okay, he has a renunciate that, you know, hundreds of thousands of years later, I don't actually know when he was, is still the number one economic driver of Assisi. You know, that's why people go there. And he has a renunciate who went to be alone in the woods and started you know, the deepest movement towards compassion, towards self and nature and the magic of the poor. And so it's back, it's backwards in the mystic. You mm. know? And I kept thinking about it because I was doing these, these daily recordings, um, which have been released now as a podcast. And it's like, I spoke to more people too, in some ways because that, you know, people have been listening to that I went to be alone. And in some ways I spoke to more people during that time than ever before. <laughs> Everything's back backwards in the mystic. Yeah. So, you know, you start to find connection wherever you are um, and it won't come from people. It starts inside and then the rest starts to flow to that, you know? Yeah, really, really well said. There was a a teacher that uh, Anahata Ananda, who I work with out in Sedona, and whenever somebody has, you know, an an issue or or what they're, what they're, looking for she always flips it and she reverses it in like a really like that's the shamanic way to like look at the other side and from that's the that's the mystical approach you know so so it's like you know i'm here for what's your intention uh love okay breathe into the places where you have grievance you know breathe in like it's always like yeah it's like you don't look straight at the thing like let's go let's go to the opposite of that or the judgments like I right, breathe into your judgments. Yeah. And then you'll find as, as you go through that, through the thicket of that, you'll find on the other side is exactly what you're looking for. But if you just go for that, love, 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 love. Well, maybe maybe you'll get there. But the, the mystic way is to go the other yeah. way. It's always in reverse with the with the freaking mystics. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Same Buddha goes to the grove and and you know, the, the people it's only when he goes to be alone that everyone starts to come and 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 a whole movement starts from that. It's just all backwards. Yeah. I want to go back to shame a little bit because this is a very human, this is a very human thing to mm-hmm. hold this shame. Because like I you see on these animal shows that, you know, an animal will challenge the alpha. Mm-hmm. Whatever. It could be a ram, it could be a bear, it could be whatever. But you challenge the alpha for, you know, control of whatever pack, uh, you know. And one of the animals loses. Now, in our world, shame. Mm-hmm. You know, there's like a lot of shame. If you go and challenge and you lose, then you have the shame and then people are like, oh man, he lost. And then you have to deal with this whole thing. I can only imagine that that animal, maybe they're a little hurt. You know, they physically, they they shake it off. But 
they don't carry, they can't carry that level of shame where they're thinking in that story like, yeah. oh man, I'm such a bitch. You know, I, I could have had him, but I didn't. And now look at me. What am I? Some beta, some yeah. beta antelope? Like, <laughs> how pathetic, <laughs> you know, just sitting around beating themselves up like we would, you know? It doesn't happen. They're just on with the next thing. I mean, so what is that environment? Well, firstly, it's a wordless environment. Um, so there is no verbal mind. So when you go into it, it starts to pull you out of the verbal. Uh, and when it starts to pull you out of the verbal, just like would happen in a ceremony, there's a dissolution and that starts to pull you into more oneness. It just naturally happens. There's, the density of verbalness in nature is not there. There's, so the animals exist in a state of pure presence. And even our language of like what's going on in that encounter starts to break down. Like, you know, um, you know, here are, here's a, uh, a lioness is feeding and the cub comes over and the lioness growls and swipes at the cub. And the people on the safari truck go, that lioness is so mean to the cub. So here's our verbal projection onto mm. it. And what I see is the maintenance of harmony mm -hmm. and energetic maintenance of harmony. So the alpha, um, ah, the alpha now he's the winner and this one is lost. <laughs> or there's just a movement of energy towards uh, more harmony. And harmony, uh, it, you know, my definition would be everything is uniquely itself. And in being itself, it belongs to the whole symphony, your, yeah. or your to your point, the tone. Um, and so... If we're lonely, we're not fully ourself yet because the more we become ourself, it becomes impossible not to belong. Different, not the same, not imitating, not emulating, not perfect, whole as ourself. And then we're in the beat, you know, we're in the beat as, as our perfect tone within it. Yeah. Yeah. I That's mean, you don't see lions. I mean, I think we spoke about this last time, like, oh man, you know, they're just not lying around thinking, could have got that buffalo yesterday. <laughs> what is wrong with this team at the moment? <laughs> you guys aren't performing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, there's, just, there's none of that. There's rest, then intensity, then feeding. They all smack each other around. Then rest again, bonding. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so many of the ways that we act are so human in the way, which is very traumatizing. You know, the way that we have, we hold these emotional states, even states of like when we're trying to punish, you know, it's not just like the like the lion mother, you know, just like ah, yeah, like stop, like and then it's over. It's not like she's holding some like vengeance or something. Gone. It's just quick yeah. and then done. And so there's nothing there. So you know, we just got new kittens, and you know that's what you know, I'm talking to my wife Ilana about, and she gets it, you know. But like it's it's uh. People are like, you know, you can't scold you can't scold a cat. I'm like, of course, yeah, you can't do what you do with a dog, which is, you know, if they go pee on your shoes, grab them by the scruff, put, put their face in the yeah. pee and say, bad cat, bad cat. Like, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. They don't yeah. get it. But in the moment, if you hiss or growl or like snarl or make a sharp sound, you know, and then it's over. And then they'll be like, oh, yeah, okay, got it. You know, and then that's like, that. again, it's just a way to create harmony so that then you're not holding all of that anger of like can't believe this cat's doing it just yeah. be there in the moment let it know and done and imagine if um if what you the boundaries you create in your house are not you asserting yourself or having to get the kids in line with just the maintenance of harmony that's how we maintain it and there's also clean pain and dirty pain right mm. clean pain um the lioness snarls and slaps the cub backs off, uh, maybe catches a little clip, it passes. Dirty pain is the story of my, my lioness mother never loved me. <laughs> um, this always happens to me. Yeah. I get rejected at the kill. Yeah. You know, uh, that's, and my sister what, yeah. didn't get and smacked it, and, and I got smacked. Suddenly and, we're in, and then yeah. we all do that. Um, so how fast can we you know, just let things unfold? Um, yeah, let go of our stories. The stories, man, that's where, that's, that's the core of it. What is, what story are we telling? What story are we telling? What, and what's under it? And retelling and retelling and then getting back into that wild, the wild experience of it. 
and and just seeing it without all the stories i think that's really important and we have to be careful we're never going to be able to not tell stories we're a storytelling creature that's one of the ways that we cognitively process the whole world but being mindful being the observer being the tracker of the stories you know like can you track when you're telling a story and what your story is and call it what it is and then that way it gives you some agency to realize ah i could have a new story i remember man in the middle of my ayahuasca you know so there's two days of drinking ayahuasca one day of rest two days there was something that came up from ordinary life you know from back home Mm -hmm. and because of the medicine always working i developed this story and this story was this person betrayed me and i can't why that why would they i can't believe they're doing mm-hmm. this I, I was so like worked up about it eventually called you know a mutual friend who's also a medicine man and he was like yeah man i i hear your story here but you know i i think there's a different story i, I don't think that story is the same story that i would tell and i was like okay and he told me and he told me his interpretation yeah and i was like oh man that story is so much better that's such a much better story from my life all of this anxiousness and all of this neurotic energy and frustration that i was feeling just by shifting timelines to a different story it doesn't even matter which story was true maybe mine was right maybe his was right but by me living in his story I got to rest. I got to enjoy my dinner. I'm still holding on to his story because you know why? It's a better fucking story. Yeah. And why not choose the story with less suffering? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, was for even, sure. I was even joking, like, uh, you know, I crashed uh, our buddy's car uh, in the Austin yeah. snowstorm. So, like, on one level, it's like, you know, here comes the story of you're, you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, you're a South African, you're driving in a snowstorm. Who do you think you are? You're always a too overconfident. <laughs> you always just want to push it. You were trying to get to a meeting, you, you know. And so there's that story of like idiot Boyd, you yeah. know, boosts his buddy's car and puts it in a ditch. <laughs> and then here's like the real story is like the car slipped. Uh, it hit a cement girder, which broke, which mean I didn't go in a ravine. It stopped. Um, Five people came out and said, are you okay? We're here for you. Do you need to use our phone? Do you need to, uh, what do you need? Can we try and help you in any way? The entire like universe showed up to say like, are you okay? Can we help you? No one was hurt. Everything was good. What, you know, what do you choose? Right. In reality, a car had slipped off the road and everyone was trying to be nice to me and help me. Yeah. And I could have lived, you know, lying in bed, wave of shame four days later, you always push it too hard and, you know, you always, you know, whatever. That's that's the story. And we think that it's productive. We think that it's productive because if we punish ourselves severely, we'll learn the lesson. Yeah. And then then that's what's necessary. But it actually doesn't work. It's like a a maltrained, like non-adaptive part of our brain because when we punish ourselves that severely, then we, instead of learning you know the lesson which is it is important to learn and reflect and be like okay yeah duly noted however when we punish ourselves that severely we have the shame and then the shame is like a blindness where we don't want to look at it so we eventually find all these excuses and rationalizations and it actually blocks our awareness of seeing what was actually happening because we're so afraid of the judge that we're always like like you would when we're in school and you're going to the principal you're coming up with all kinds of excuses or if you're going talking about a speeding ticket you're like well you know at this point the sun was here and then the light was yeah. here you're fucking coming up with all this yeah. rationalization it's like no nah, i just like to go fast yeah. like that's the truth but when you have a strong overbearing judge in your own mind you're going to start wiggling around and waffling and creating all these rationalizations and justifications for everything cuz you can't bear that oppressive pressure of your own internal judge. Yeah. And to let, I mean, the other thing I guess that I saw out there in the tree is like when, I, when I'm when i unaware of the shame that I'm carrying and when, because it's shame, I don't want to feel it, it starts to, it starts to drive me, yeah. you know, in unconscious ways. Like I want to distract myself so that I never have to feel that. And when I finally slowed down enough out there to look at it and let it arise and let myself feel it and experience it in an environment that could actually hold it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have the charge that it, uh, and there's nothing like a feeling of connection that lets that stuff move and then, then it doesn't hold us like it used to. And that is the core of inner work, letting 
letting the parts of ourselves that we don't want to come up, up, uh, being aware of them and then letting them move. Yeah. And nature, nature will naturally take you there. Yeah. Na- nature will naturally take you to, to a different speed. Nature will naturally change your uh, immune system, um, sorry, your nervous system and your immune system. Uh, nature naturally creates cu- community when we go out there together. We run this dude's retreat and, you know, the guys arrive on the retreat. We spend a few days tracking. On one of the days, we go out and we sleep on the ground together. And this amazing feeling as night is falling and it feels very ancient archetypal. You get the fire going, group of guys close in, lions are roaring, a big elephant bull walks past. You know, it's, it's happening. And now it's mm. getting dark and dark is not our, something in the monkey starts going like, sure. here we go. And the group is a, it's a transformational group. So guys have been doing their work, but that night you sit around the fire and you keep watch for each other. And, and you know, in that like 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. darkness, you know, owls calling around you, a leopard calling and then calling closer and then calling closer. Um, something happens during that night. The next morning, the group is in a radically different place with each other. Mm. They have sat for each other. Um, they've kept each other safe through that night. And the next morning, it's like, guys, who've come from different walks of life. It's the banter is happening. You know, the, the bullshitting is happening. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, like, without it needing to be facilitated, we're at a deeper level with each other. Yeah. And I just think the natural world is, is you can't really beat it for that. I think um, that what you're talking about with that banter and that kind of, I mean, we get that in sports. And I think that's like one of the things that I love so much. Like I have this huge release when I go play basketball or play like a, especially a contact sport yeah. where we're getting in and, you know, we're talking shit. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it gets heated out there, you yeah. know, but at the end, I always feel closer to the person who I got into it with than than i did before even if it gets you know rough like we're arguing over a call and we start hitting each other and it's like not with our fists but like bumping each other and like really going at it and then at the end there's like this like oh yeah we we did it we tussled and like we we like had a thing and and we really do need that and it's just like a we have you know as i said these two cats which are now me you know we've locked in the snowstorm we've been observing them closely (laughs) they will just go at each other yeah not violently but they're just tussling around one of them's got this cat jujitsu where they're holding one up and then hitting them with the back legs you know and then they're like going around one's bigger than the other so he's got the weight advantage the other's got like speed and they're all just jumping off things and just surprise attacking each other and it's like and then they just cuddle all night in the same little hat on top of the cat tree just and licking each other and cuddling and we don't get that we don't get that very often And, and i think you know particularly looking at the feminine men actually get that a bit more because we have sports and we we get into shit talking even if we're playing golf yeah you know like the fun part about playing golf with your homies is the massive amount of shit that you're going to talk the entire time and that kind of like banter is really necessary and i think you know for women who are athletes and it's not all women some women have that relationship where they get in the group but that's i think important for all male female whoever it doesn't matter like to get in that thing where you're joking with each other nothing serious and you're fucking around and and that and being physical it's important yeah and the other side of that coin as you're talking what's making me think about it is you know that moment in a ceremony where it's uh especially one that is allowed, like I think you guys used to also uh, do a style that was slightly less, you know, stay on your mat where things are allowed to move around. But it's like people have been through the, like the deep tunnel and now everyone is in the room together and there's like a silence that has fallen over the room. No one's trying to connect. No one's processing. No one's talking. There's just this silent uh, group of people lying in an energy field together, like limbs a little bit over each other. Mm -hmm. And you feel that wordless dimension, like descending over it. um, And you realize that, you know, that same camaraderie we find around the fire, that same camaraderie, we find it when we drop out of the wordless, the, the, you know, the the space of verbal together in those spaces. And you actually find like, there's a way of being together that is largely being lost. And I don't know why it's being lost, but we are forgetting how to just be together at levels deeper then you know like places without where people aren't putting on any show you know too much person not enough animal yeah too much that's it 
I mean, yeah. it's just, and we're getting more and more in our personhood. We're, Too much social, like yeah. socialized. And, and we're just building our identity further and further. We have a, a public social identity through our social media. And then we have our social circle here. And then we have, okay, what's in our neighborhood or around our neighbors? And then what's in our work social identity? We have all of these identities that we're maintaining, all of our personhoods that we're maintaining and where everybody's their own personal brand. And so it's our, it's our livelihood. So it's tied into this. So it's all of these different things, but underneath all that, it's just all a bunch of, we're all a bunch of animals. Yeah. And maybe that's what the mystics knew. That's maybe that's the, the final answer to the question, you know, is at a certain point in any awakening, you have to go and be away from all of the voices of others and all of the voices of your own shoulds, how I should hold myself so that you can be in an environment that starts to connect you with that, that silent knowing inside yourself. And, and maybe that's, maybe that's why they all went every, every one of them at a certain point, it's like, I can't get what I need here from more opinions, more different ways of doing it, more of my own ideas about it somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. I had an incredibly potent uh, mushroom ceremony, psilocybin ceremony, probably three years ago or so when things were really challenging and there was an incredibly clear message and the message was you got to go to australia and you got to start on a walkabout and wind up at uluru wow and it's like this is what this it was so specific (laughs) it was like you must you've got to go do this and i was like whoa like that is like very specific and it was i was like what do i do he's like just head out in that direction. You'll find your you'll find your purposeful way. action towards an unknown <laughs> yeah, purpose. <laughs> exactly, and and I never did it, you know. And I've still, but I've thought about it a lot, and I know that at some point, I'm gonna have to not have to, but I want to. Like I yeah. want to have that experience where I'm just headed towards something where I loosely know where I'm going. Yeah, and just trust and like let it let it be. And I know that's gonna be amazing medicine. The, the lost art form of becoming, you know, evolution. Yeah. Well, man, do you have a, let's finish with a story. Let's finish uh, with a story. Any story that, uh, that you feel resonates and, and, uh, and makes sense with anything we've been talking about or anything you just want to talk about. Let's end with the story. Mm, what's a good one? Um, that crossing point that was just downstream, that crossing point rendered quite a lot of action because the animals would come down there to cross. And one afternoon I'm sitting on the point and the, there was a little piece where the riverbank juts out. And what was amazing about it is you were able to look downstream and upstream at the same time. And the river is running east west, so you get a beautiful wow. sunset uh, either side of it. And I was sitting there and from behind me, um, walking down into the crossing point comes a huge bull rhino. And rhinos, rhinos have like a very particular energy to them. They have incredibly poor eyesight, very good hearing, very good sense of smell. And one of the great dangers of being around a rhino is he's not aggressive, but often he runs off in the wrong direction (laughs) and quite often towards what he's afraid of. He's just blind. It's like, danger, danger. And he starts heading off in your direction. Born first. Yeah, and so mostly um, people get rolled over by rhinos because he ran off in the wrong direction. So as he's coming down towards me, I also have this thing where I, I always think that rhinos have like a few, maybe like four thoughts a day. <laughs> now they'll be, you'll, if you watch them, if you spend a lot of time tracking and observing them, you go, hum, 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 food. <laughs> and then he'll go, sleep. And then he heads off. And it's not to like, as I said, it's not to like a random tree, a tree that he knows, a place that he likes to sleep, sleeps there, wakes up, water. <laughs> and then he heads to drink. And it's it's like beautiful to watch their their rhythm. Um, but anyway, I he's coming. The other one is sex. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> female rhinos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, he's coming down towards me. And it was it was I was awkwardly positioned. So my my options are um move move up the bank, but one minute I move, he's gonna get me tapped on the ears. Or um like shuffle my ass back so that I'm just behind a tree. And, and so I go for the latter and I just move ever so slightly. I get to the base of this tree, but it's tight as he comes down. And so it means that he's going to walk past me like you to me and I'm sitting down. And 
when you're on the ground like that and a rhino walks next to you, it's like someone just drove a Sherman tank up next to you. And it's uh, like his shadow fell over me and the wrinkles on his face and the proximity. And I know that if he gets, a, if he gets wind of me now, or if he gets a fright, there's a chance in just spinning around that he stands on me. Um, and I, and like, I couldn't help but have the thought, like told everyone I was going into the, like into the <laughs> wild to be like wild man in nature. And like day three, Boyd got stood on by a rhino. <laughs> He's back in the hospital, you know, it's like you just had that little moment of like this whole enterprise falls apart. If I get <laughs> like trampled by a rhino right now. Yeah. Um, but he just came, he came like directly past me and he stopped for a moment and he was testing the wind and the breeze blew and it was in my favor. Breeze is coming from him to me. And the, the way that time just expanded on the ground next to this huge bull rhino. Um, and I felt that place of awe where you feel simultaneously, absolutely tiny and really like a part of something vast at the same time. And then he walked down into the river and immediately there was enough space. I just sat still and I watched him and I thought to myself, you know, this experience is so deep for me now. I'm healing so many things. I'm in an encounter with nature that is absolutely transformative. But what does this experience mean in 20 years from now? In 20 years from now, when kids have grown up in screens, when there's virtual reality, um, what will it mean to have been someone who encountered uh, a wild rhino, you know, an animal that is getting still to this day massively poached and could go extinct at any time. What will it mean to be someone who lived alone in a wild place with wild animals in 20 years from now? I felt like there would be an opportunity uh, at that phase of my life for a real eldership, you know, a yeah. chance that I had experienced something that, wow, we could be, a, we could be much closer to or a long, long way away from in 20 years you know we really we could go we could get fully reset back to nature um and this whole human endeavor could have been a clearing in the forest or we could be so far away from nature that we don't even you know we're we're literally virtually dimensions away from it um and so i felt like i was i'm carrying i'm carrying some medicine now and my work will continue to be to be in service of people becoming more natural so that we can be more in tune with the natural world, you know? Oh, yeah. It's important. Uh, a Lion Tracker's Guide to Life. Amazing book. We talked about it on our last podcast, which I highly recommend anybody who hasn't listened to that. Yeah, a Lion Tracker's Guide to Life and boydvati.com. And, you know, for people in your community who are doing work, we just launched our, our online retreat. And if anyone wants to be involved in the process of, you know, learning the the way of the tracker. It's a really powerful uh, eight modules that'll take you into identifying your track, uh, tuning back into your body, becoming more instinctual, working out what you want to follow and where you want to go. And I think uh, it's really good for people who are at any level who are looking to go inward and do their work. At some point when uh, when all the travel restrictions and everything lifts and we're in a, in a different time than we are now, I'd love to do, first of all, go experience it myself, but then I think that's the first step. But then uh, eventually, yeah, do some kind of retreat out there on the land and, and go, uh, go experience some of the yeah. things that you're talking about because it sounds incredible. Come out, you know, there's, uh, I, I also think that there's work to be done there um, that is really on a beautiful, it's a beautiful frontier of, of not only being in nature, but then working out how to open our consciousness to experience that nature more deeply. And so I think, you know, it'd be a fun place to co-create on. Let's yeah. do it. Always enjoying being, being with you, man. Yeah, yeah, brother. Thank you. Always, my man. Yeah. Always. This is great. Made it happen in the snowstorm of the century here. Beautiful. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And thank you to everybody tuning in on the Fit for Service Academy live stream. Thanks for tuning into the podcast with Boyd Vardy. Make sure you check out his book, A Lion Tracker's Guide to Life. And once again, if you're looking for a community and looking to see what your sacred role in that community might be, go to aubreymarcus.com slash tribe. Find out if you're the scout, the elder, the anchor, or the alchemist, or some combination in between. It's really fun, and I encourage you guys to check that out. I love you guys. I'll see you next week.